Well, it has been a while since I've uploaded a video. I haven't been very active lately on YouTube. Uh, one of the reasons for that is the uh, connection that I have has greatly... Um, I downgraded it, so I don't get as much uh, bandwidth, I, I guess would be the term. Uh, so it takes hours uh, to upload a single video once it's recorded. I've um, got a big debate coming up with Theophage. Um, we're not going to be debating, we are not going to be debating whether God exists or not. Um, that's old school, that's, that's uh, passe. Uh, the wave of the future is to debate whether or not it's possible that God exists. Uh, because, as all you Plantingians know, if it's even possible that God exists, uh, then he definitely exists. Now, that's not immediately obvious, uh, but that is something that uh, Alvin Plantinga and others have argued, that uh, uh, Antheophage agrees uh, with that, that God's existence is either uh, impossible or uh, a necessary fact. Uh, not just a fact, but a necessary fact. Well, I, I've been reading uh, a book, uh, a very good book, that I highly recommend to um, you if you are interested in these sorts of things, uh, by Gleason Archer. It's called A Survey of Old Testament Introduction. Uh, so he goes through uh, examining, you know, who wrote which books and and in the Old Testament and, and stuff like that, when it was written. Uh, perhaps who it was addressed to. Um, and in Appendix 3, uh, Appendix 3 is called Anachronisms and Historical Inaccuracies in the Mormon Scriptures. Um, and I just thought I'd, I'd uh, mention a few of these, uh, and hopefully um, if there are any Mormons out there listening, they will uh, respond to this video and uh, uh, try to provide a, and I challenge you to do this, uh, to provide a um, plausible uh, explanation uh, for these, uh, because what they appear to do is to uh, throw our confidence in the Book of Mormon, if we have confidence in it as uh, inspired uh, by God uh, and accurate history, uh, that would seem to be inconsistent with these uh, points. So I'm not going to go through the whole appendix, uh, but just a few things. Uh, in First Nephi chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, it is stated that the river Laman, L-A-M-A-N, emptied into the Red Sea, yet neither in historic nor prehistoric times has there been any river in Arabia at all that emptied into the Red Sea apart from an ancient canal which once connected the Nile with the coast of the Gulf of Suez and certain wadis which showed occasional rainfall in ancient times there were no streams of any kind emptying into the Red Sea on the western shore above the southern border of Egypt. So uh, we have uh, the Book of Mormon saying that uh, and, and First Nephi was written by somebody from the area uh, allegedly uh, um, a man named Nephi uh, from that area, uh, if he says a river emptied into the Red Sea and a river did not empty into the Red Sea, uh, then that caught, raises doubts in our mind uh, that he was an eyewitness uh, of the land and the times that he is said to be an eyewitness of. Um, so it seems that uh, somebody at another time in another place made up the book of First Nephi. Okay. Uh, Alma 46 verse 15 uh, says that uh, believers were called Christians back in 73 BC uh, rather than an Antioch, as Acts 11:26 informs us. So, uh, uh, 73 BC that was before Christ, obviously, and it, it's hard enough to imagine people being called Christians prior to um, the birth of Christ, because uh, how can you be a follower of Christ if nobody knows who Christ is, because he hasn't been born yet. Um, but 
Also, in Acts, it does say that uh, the followers of Christ uh, were first called Christians in Antioch. First in Antioch. This was in 1 AD, uh, 73 BC. And you actually see uh, the term Christian, Christianity, churches, uh, these kind of words all through the Book of Mormon, um, which is anachronistic. Helaman chapter 12, verses 25 to 26, which was uh, allegedly written in 6 BC, quotes John chapter 5, verse 29 as a prior written source, introducing it by the words, we read, quote, we read, unquote. Uh, so uh, it's not just a case of uh, a similar wording of John chapter 5, verse 29. It actually starts off by saying, we read this uh, New Testament book, or, or we read, and, and then it gives the, the verse from John 5.29. Uh, but John 5.29 uh, was written uh, after the birth of Christ. Uh, the most common dating uh, is around 90 AD. Uh, so that's long after 6 BC. Now, the seventh uh, anachronism listed here, I'll read it to you. Uh, Quite numerous are the instances in which the Mormon scriptures, said to have been in possession of the Nephites back in 600 B.C., quote from or allude to passages or episodes found only in the exilic or post-exilic books of the Old Testament. And then he lists several examples. Uh, so the uh, story... Uh, in the Book of Mormon, is that the uh, Nephites uh, left uh, Jerusalem, um, I think, I think it was right before the exile, if I remember correctly, uh, right before the, the exile uh, in Babylon, I think, they left um, uh, the, the land of Israel came to America, and they brought their, their scriptures with them, uh, which would have included um, uh, various things uh, that are in the Old Testament as well as outside of the Old Testament. Um, and the, the quotations uh, from books uh, that they will quote uh, in the Book of Mormon, there's quotations from things written after they supposedly left. So uh, they, they leave in, say, 600 B.C., and then they're quoting things from 400 B.C., uh, 200 years after they left. Well, there was no way they could have had those uh, with them. Um, they, they, they weren't... Whoops. Uh, there, there was no way they could have, could have had that... Uh, the book of Daniel say, uh, whereas Daniel wasn't even born until after they left Egypt and came to America. Um, so that is one of the uh, many problems uh, with the Book of Mormon. Uh, another problem, uh, an anachronism that's not uh, mentioned in the survey of Old Testament introduction, is the phrase, and it came to pass. Uh, now, there's nothing wrong with that expression. Uh, it's a perfectly legitimate expression to use. Uh, however, um, it, it would be idiosyncratic to use it uh, a lot. Um, so, if, if almost every verse, if almost every sentence you write starts off, it came to pass, comma, uh, that would be unusual uh, for somebody to write that way. Now, that doesn't mean that a person writing that way could not be writing true history or could not be inspired by God. Uh, but what we do, but what we find is that the entire Book of Mormon is like that. So it's not just Nephi. In First Nephi, it's all the authors all the way through have this same idiosyncrasy. Uh, so we would not, we would, we would not expect. Uh, we would not expect a, a whole bunch of authors to have that same idiosyncrasy. Um, 
So that uh, is a problem for the view that uh, Joseph Smith did not write the Book of Mormon. Uh, the, the claim uh, within Mormonism is that he is translating, oh, excuse me, that he's translating what uh, all these different ancient authors wrote um, on golden plates. So uh, if, if, and Mormon apologists will sometimes uh, try to, to make arguments that, that uh, the author of Hellman and the author of 1st Nephi, for example, were uh, different people, that Joseph Smith couldn't have written the whole thing. Well, uh, it seems that he did write the whole thing uh, because the same idiosyncrasy is found all the way through out the Book of Mormon. Um, another problem, uh, idiosyncrasy, is that in First and Second Nephi, uh, there are lo uh, large quotations from the book of Isaiah. Uh, now, the book of Isaiah uh, is something that uh, I believe it's the longest book in the Old Testament, uh, second only to Psalms, uh, so, so it's quite long. Now, the thing about Isaiah is... Well, for one thing, it would have been hard to to uh, uh, have a complete version of Isaiah uh, before they left. I, I think. Don't quote me on that, but I think it's cutting cutting it pretty close to the time that Isaiah was written and the time that the Nephites left uh, Israel. Uh, but the other problem is that uh, they're writing on gold plates, uh, so it's very hard. Uh, there's only a limited amount of space. Uh, they complain within the Book of Mormon that they, they, they don't have enough space to write everything that they want to write, that they have to be very, very selective, very concise, uh, that it's hard to to engrave the letters uh, on the plates. Uh, it, it takes a lot of, of effort to do that. Uh, but yet, they're quoting large passages from the book of Isaiah, um, which, by the way, uh, are uh, not the Masoretic text of Isaiah, uh, but the King James Version in English uh, of Joseph Smith's day um, uh, is what they're quoting. Uh, so uh, the King James Version was 1611 A.D., 1 uh, Nephi, 2 Nephi, about 600 B.C. Uh, so uh, we would expect the language uh, to be quite a bit different uh, from the uh, you know word for word uh, King James. Uh, you know, cut and pasted uh, into the books of First and Second Nephi. Uh, so that's three. That's three problems. One, uh, the time. Did they have enough time to to uh, get the Book of Isaiah before they left? Maybe they did, uh, but uh, I think it would have been difficult to do that. Number two, it's the King James version, uh, which seems very suspicious. Uh, number three, uh, which hadn't been written yet as well, uh, and number three. Uh, they are uh, it's so hard to do this. They don't have enough time. They don't have enough space. Uh, but yet they they go on and on and on, quoting chapter after chapter after chapter of the Book of Isaiah, uh, even though they don't they have hardly any room on these golden plates. Uh, so please uh, try to uh, meet this challenge if you are Mormon, and uh, give uh, an explanation of how this doesn't uh, lower our confidence. Uh, in the Book of Mormon, which is the foundation uh, of the Mormon religion. If the Book of Mormon goes, uh, then all of Mormonism uh, goes along with it. Uh, thank you for watching, and Shalom out.